This morning comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans, beginning in chapter 7, with verse 15. In fact, I don't understand why I act the way I do. I don't do what I know is right. I do the things I hate. Although I don't do what I know is right, I agree that the law is good. And so I am not the one doing these evil things. The sin that lives in me is what does them. I know that my selfish desires won't let me do anything that is good. Even when I want to do right, I cannot. Instead of doing what I know is right, I do wrong. And so, if I don't do what I know is right, I am no longer the one doing these evil things. The sin that lives in me is what does them. The law has shown me that something in me keeps me from doing what I know is right. With my whole heart, I agree with the law of God. But in every part of me, I discover something fighting against my mind, and it makes me a prisoner of sin that controls everything I do. What a miserable person I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is doomed to die? Thank God. Jesus Christ will rescue me. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. You may not realize it, but you are part of the most photographed generation in history. Every store just about that you waltz into, every intersection that you maybe speed through at the last possible moment, uh, every ATM that you access, every family party that you attend where your aunt with the camera that takes gazillions of pictures and she's not sure how it works, you know that kind of aunt, don't you? You're photographed all the time. But truth be told, perhaps the greatest culprit in our photo-obsessed society isn't that crazy aunt or big brother or, or whatever. Maybe it's us ourselves. You know, Debbie and I, I'm bringing us into this, dear. We're a prime example because in the life of our children, by conservative estimates... I have probably taken over 100,000 pictures. I'm, I'm serious, folks. You know, I can take a camera and go to a sports event and, and snap off six or 700 pictures in one day. And David is 17 now. The most photographed child. Every month on his birthday, for like the first two years, we would take a picture of him just to see how he changed. We like to take pictures. We take them all the time. But perhaps one of the, the, the biggest kind of pictures that are, that are growing is the, called the selfie. You know, that picture in which you take your phone out and hold it up and snap a picture. I was taking some selfies this morning with some of you. I will be posting them on the web later on. <laughs> Just so that you can get an idea of what a selfie is in case you haven't figured it out. You know, the modern mind thinks this way. You know, it's a slow day at work. I'm looking pretty fine today. I'll take a picture and send it off so my friends will know that even though I'm bored to death, I still look good while I'm bored. Or how about that new pair of sunglasses you wanted to buy the other day? You put them on, email your friends, send it off Instagram, whatever you do. Do I look good in these? You wait for the response and then pick the one on, based on votes maybe. Or how about an amazing meal? Those are the ones that always confuse me, you know. I'm glad that hamburger looks so good to you. I'm glad that, that steak looks so good, but do we really need to see that? Do you really need to share that particular aspect of what's going on in your life? Selfies. Well, in today's text, 
We have from Paul what is nothing less, I think, than a selfie. Now, it wasn't taken with a photo. It was pen and papyrus on paper. But it is a picture of how the Apostle Paul sees himself. He's not talking about, does my hair look good? Am I posing well with my friends? He's given us a snapshot of himself that's raw. It's unfiltered. And, it, and according to Paul's own assessment, it's deeply unflattering. In other words, he's not saying stuff about himself that, that is going to make him look good in the eyes of those that might read it. Paul's looking at himself and basically saying, man, I'm a mess. And so he writes, For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. His snapshot, then, reveals to us a man that's tossed back and forth between what he, he sees as two forces that are working within him. His heart and his mind are being pulled back and forth. Paul knows without a doubt that he is in Christ. And as such, he knows that he is a new creation. He knows that he is no longer defined by that which is corrupt in him. But as seen by God, he is instead dressed up in the goodness, in the rightness of Jesus Christ, the righteousness that, that brings him his salvation. That's what he knows. But yet deep down inside of him remains that power of sin. You see, it remains at residence in his flesh and in his bones. It rears his ugly its ugly head, it, it draws him from that path that God, that new path that comes from being a new creature in Christ, that path that God sets before him, that it draws him away from that. And he suddenly finds himself in turmoil. Now you need to keep in mind that Paul is not a newborn Christian. Most scholars would agree that at this point in his life, he has known Christ for at least 25 years. And still, he is struggling. At the time those words were penned, he had known Christ, he had walked with Christ, he had done what Christ had wanted him to do, and yet he said those same things about himself. I don't do the things I want to do. Instead, I end up doing the things that I hate. Paul's selfie reveals to us that he is, despite maybe the gray hair on his head, the lines of wisdom on his face, that he is still simultaneously both a saint saved by the grace of God through Jesus Christ and also a sinner dealing with his sin. He's righteous in the eyes of God because of what Christ has done for him. And yet he is broken to the core, it seems almost, because of the sin that still seems to move in his life. There's a Native American tale. Oh, it's well known, I'm, I'm told, according to my a source for uh, illustrations and stuff that reminds us of that truth. A, a Cherokee grandfather, and Becky's going to help me with this. She's going to tell me tomorrow whether I got it right or not. A Cherokee grandfather once said to his grandson, there is a battle between two wolves inside all of us. One is evil. It is anger, jealousy, greed, resentment, inferiority, lies, and ego. The other is good. It is joy. Peace, love, hope, humility, kindness, empathy, and truth. Well, the little boy thought about it, and then he asked, Grandfather, which wolf wins? And the old man replied, The one you feed. You know, based upon that text, perhaps Paul might agree. You see, the honesty of Paul's self-portrait is, is jarring to us, isn't it? especially when held in contrast to the selfies in which we often indulge in our own lives. You see, if we're honest, we have to admit that when we snap a picture of ourselves, we try to do so in the most flattering light possible. How many of us take a photo and then in this day and age look at it before we decide if we're going to keep that photo or not? Have you ever done that? Raise your hand. 
Now, for those that didn't raise your hand, come on, really? You've, ne <laughs> you've never done that before? <laughs> I wonder. You know, the fact that our cameras are with us at all times, that they allow for an infinite number of do-overs, and that they come with a treasure trove of editing options from cropping to filters to retouching, all of it in the palm of our hands nowadays, it's empowered us not only to shift the focus to ourselves, but it's empowered us to pose and to posture and to present a particular self to the rest of the world. You see, if we want to be seen as the girl with the pouty duck lips like a lot of selfies seem to have, or the buff guy that's always at the gym flexing his muscles, or the fun friend that's always doing something crazy at a party, then we can and we can keep taking the picture till we get it just right. Because that's what we want the world to see. And no one will ever see anything else, at least not on our Instagram feed, or our Facebook, or wherever we post the picture. And yet Paul, he knew that there was a power in an unfiltered assessment of life. That there's power for the followers of Jesus in that no makeup, harshly lit selfie that shows every wrinkle. And the power, of course, is that the more honestly that we assess ourselves, the more that we admit our deep, continuing brokenness, then the more heroic, the more grace-filled, and the more generous Jesus can begin to look to us. If we know truly that deep down we are sinners, saved by God's grace, then perhaps we will begin to appreciate that grace all the more. Paul knew that. He knew that by staring at his unflattering selfie, he was less likely to be fooled by that facade of awesomeness that he and every other human tries to put forth so that the, that's what the world sees. And he knew that instead the the more he understood himself, the more beautiful and necessary the love of Christ could become in his own life. Remember his words in 2 Corinthians 12? He said, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness. So, so that what? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, it, not only was it good for Paul, but Paul, in writing this letter to the church at Rome, knew that his transparency would be good for his people, those that were reading it. You've got to understand something about preachers. In seminary, one of the first things they tell us is that you should never be transparent. You should never let folks understand who you are because that will ruin their picture of what the preacher's like. That's drilled into us. I'm sort of glad that Paul never went to seminary. It wasn't drilled into him. He showed us this unflattering picture of himself. He showed us that he was full of wrinkles and faults and shortcomings. He says, wretched man that I am. How many times have you called yourself wretched lately? Paul did. Wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? You know, that's a powerful statement. That's a, a question that a preacher needs to ask, that every one of us needs to ask ourselves. But there is yet an even more powerful answer, because what did he respond to and say? He said, thanks be to God, Jesus Christ will rescue me. He will pull me from this pit of sin and despair that I'm in because of what he has done but, and not because of anything that I have done because I continue to dig the hole deeper. I continue to let the sin pull me down. I continue to do those things I don't want to do. But Jesus Christ, he will rescue me. He will throw me the line. He will pull me out. So, when it comes to the act of taking actual selfies, 
I think that there are certainly things to keep in mind. There are appropriate times and inappropriate. Enjoying good times with your friends? Take a selfie. Attending a funeral? Not a good idea. Just ask President Obama and a few other world leaders. But if we look more closely at what Paul is doing, I, I think there's something here to which we have to pay closer attention. You know, as Christians, and especially I want to take a moment to talk to the leaders of the church, perhaps we need to ask ourselves these kinds of questions. What if there's power in sharing a few unflattering selfies of your own? What if there's strength in witnessing to the fact that you still struggle, but that through Christ you're overcoming? What if showing your crow's feet wrinkles and spiritual bad hair days can be a powerful way for a leader when to help others more fully appreciate what Christ can do in their lives. And we know that there's so much to appreciate for what Christ does in our life. There are so many things for which we could give thank, thanks. Now that's one of the things that I'm trying to, to help our discipleship team think about. When we get together, you see, we spend part of our time trying to see what is happening in our various lives. It's a time to share some bad points as well as good points. It's a time for, for self-examination, a time for reflection, both things that are often quite overlooked in the narcissistic society in which we live. You know, sometimes we, we need to see not only the good in ourselves, but also the bad. Whenever Wesley and his groups got together, the first question he asked was, how is it with your soul? How are you dealing in the day-to-day -day struggle of trying to be a Christian, of trying to be a follower of Jesus Christ? If you read the uh, Romans 12 article today, it sort of talks about that same thing. Uh, tables where the people get together on a weekly basis, and that's the question they ask. Sometimes we need to stop putting on the front for the world to see and let the world understand that we aren't perfect creatures. We're sinners saved by grace. You see, in light of Paul's unflattering self-portrait in chapter 7, I find it especially uplifting to hear what he says in chapter 8, verse 1. Does anybody know what that one says? Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now... No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. After just telling the world, you know, I know that Christ saves me and I know that I struggle day in and day out. After showing the, the people in Rome that he's not the perfect saint that perhaps they had heard that he might be, he then says, even though I have my faults, even though I have my failures, even though I don't do what God wants me to do all the time, I know that therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If that's not good news, I don't know what good news is. Think about it. No matter how unflattering the image of us might be, no matter how strong the forces are that pull us and pulled Paul off the path of righteousness... God refuses to reject us. Go ahead. Hit the camera on your, eye, or your phone sometime. Show God the worst possible self that you are. Well, guess what? God promises for those that have been covered in the goodness and the blood of Jesus Christ, that those that have been injected by the power of the Holy Spirit, that there will be no words of condemnation, even if it's the worst day you've had. At times we may disgust ourselves. But God, on account of what Jesus Christ has done, will not delete our pics, will not kick us out of the family, will not unfriend us. God will continue to call us daughters and sons. In 2013, the Oxford Dictionary announced that selfie was the word of the year. That act of taking a selfie and that idea is here to stay. It's in the dictionary now. And if you don't quite yet buy into it, if you're not one of the six people remaining on earth who have not yet taken a selfie, 
then I guarantee that a son or a daughter or a niece or some tech-obsessed friend is going to come up to you like I did this morning to many of you and say, let's take a selfie. Cheese. And when it does, congratulate yourself. You'll be one of the more than 57 million on just Instagram alone that have posted a selfie. You know, if you got a phone, get it out. Because just in case you haven't taken a selfie this morning, I want some selfies taken. I'm going to start with the choir. I've already practiced this. It works, choir, if I can get the right buttons pushed. I want you all to smile back there. We're going to get in this picture. Ready? Smile. All right. I don't want them to have all the fun, though. Hold on. <laughs> we'll get you all in back there in my forehead, okay? Ready? Smile. I know. <laughs> Roy, wants, Roy wants to know if I'm off my medicines this morning or not. <laughs> if you got a phone, get up next to somebody. Take a selfie. And if you know what a hashtag is, use TUMC Worship and post it so that all of us can see these selfies. That's where I'm going to post all the ones I've taken this morning. But remember this. No matter what that picture shows, it's just an outward view of who you are. It's the view that we all see. But God sees deeper than that. God knows what's going on in our hearts. God knows what's going on in our minds. And God loves us still by saying there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so this morning, I encourage you to feed the better wolf inside. Feed that wolf that leads to acts of love acts of kindness, acts of joy, acts in which the love of God is shared with others. Take a selfie. Say cheese. Amen.